Uh, the first speaker this morning is uh, Dr. Phil Clements. Um, if we can go ahead and get his, uh, yeah, it's silent, you're uh, Dr. Clements is a native of Indiana. He received his bachelor's at Purdue, his uh, medical degree in Indiana. And um, he did his uh, training at uh, uh, Indiana University. No, he didn't. He uh, did his training at Cedars. And uh, he was a fellow then in rheumatology at UCLA and uh, joined the faculty at, the, uh, at UCLA. And he's uh, been co-editor of Systemic Sclerosis Textbook. He's editor of the uh, uh, Scleroderma Care and Research. He's been past president of the Scleroderma Trials Consortium. He's received uh, research awards. He's got 134 papers, 34 book chapters, and two books. And he's going to speak this morning on interstitial lung disease in systemic scler uh, sclerosis. Thank you for the, uh, I'd forgotten some of my past history, so thanks for bringing me up. Um, I'm here to deliver two doses of systemic sclerosis. This is the first one. I've changed the title a little bit, still be pretty much the same subject matter, but management of pulmonary and pulmonary vascular disease in systemic sclerosis. Um, I've actually been a sclerodermatologist for 39 years, a rheumatologist for 40. This is going to be largely case-based to kind of kick things off. So we'll start with the first case, 35-year-old female with two years of scleroderma and three months of dyspnea. In addition, she does have the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. She has a positive ANA, her SCL70 is positive. She has six months of GERD, not a cigarette smoker, and her only medicines are nifedipine and omeprazole. Physically, her vital signs are normal. She has thick skin on the face, trunk, arms, and legs and thus she has a diffuse cutaneous scleroderma as her skin manifestation of systemic sclerosis. She has inspiratory rouse late, cardiac exam is normal, CBC cam and chest x-ray are normal. I'd like to define terms because I'm going to be using limited and diffuse um, throughout both talks. So diffuse is the one where People develop thick skin on the upper arms, the chest, the belly, or the thigh. If they do that, they usually get the distal upper extremities, the face, and many times the lower extremities. On the other hand, limited never gets above the knees, never above the uh, elbows, and may affect the face but doesn't go below the clavicles. The best time to make this determination of whether someone is diffuse or limited is in the first three years because that is when the skin is at its worst in diffuse cutaneous scleroderma. So which of the following is the most appropriate test? Ventilation perfusion scan, gallium scan, bronchoprovocation testing, or complete PFTs? Now you can make your decision in your head and I'm going to eliminate the ones that I think are less correct one at a time. We don't think she has asthma, so bronchoprovocation is probably not the correct answer. Gallium scans we gave up years ago as being way too uh, false positive, way too false negative. If we thought she had a blood clot, ventilation perfusion scan would be the appropriate one, but her story doesn't really suggest that. So we are now left with complete PFTs. Now the force vital capacity is probably our best single indicator of interstitial disease. It drops below 75% in about 40% of scleroderma patients. And usually it's an early event. Most of the action in the lung is in the first four to five, six years. 10% will get severe restriction, less than uh, 55% predicted of the vital capacity. You have to be careful. 70 to 80% of scleroderma patients develop basal or fibrosis on HRCT, and not all of those have bad restriction. Many of them have normal pulmonary function. So it's the pulmonary function that tends to drive what we do in scleroderma lung disease. 
Well, a little bit of the demography. When I was a fellow years ago, um, renal crisis was the most feared complication. They'd come in, they'd be disastrous, they'd look like they'd have vasculitis and TTP and all kinds of bad things. We'd do everything we could to save them and they died. 95%, six months. Then Captopril became available in 1980, and you will notice that things really didn't change a whole lot early on. It's only later when docs became very comfortable using ACE inhibitors for diabetes, for heart disease, hypertension, that suddenly we see the risk of renal crisis death going down. It is not zero. And I will point this out several times. Uh, 20 to 25 percent of patients with renal crisis, renal failure, will die in the first year. So we don't have the cure, but we made big strides. And in its place, um, pulmonary and pulmonary vascular disease are now the leading causes of death. And it's about 50-50. So about half of them are pulmonary hypertension, half are interstitial lung disease. Well, what is the prevalence in scleroderma? Um, and there aren't many distinctions between limited and diffuse as regards interstitial lung disease, and maybe there is a little in pulmonary hypertension, but there is a false notion out there that limited disease doesn't get into trouble. Discard that. 40% of the people that came into scleroderma lung study uh, had interstitial lung disease with moderate restriction or above, and they behaved exactly the same way as the diffuse. They either got better on cyclophosphamide or they got worse on placebo. In any event, this is a rough calculation. About 30% will have a vital capacity less than 75%. Pulmonary hypertension is a difficult topic to get around because I'm showing you right heart cath data. So about 8% have isolated PAH by heart cath data. This group is underrepresented, underexamined, undertreated, um, and unfortunately is the most difficult combination of problems you can get in this area. It's somewhere around 8 to 12 percent, and that number may change. Now, if I substituted pulmonary artery pressure or right ventricular systolic pressure greater than 40 on an echo, I would double or triple this number. So there is a big discrepancy between the number on the echo and what is actually found at right heart cath, and I'll hit this subject harder later. Well, let's start with interstitial lung disease. So again, uh, about 60% uh, will not have a reduction of any significance in their vital capacity, whereas 13% uh, have terrible. It's less than 50%. Now again, frequency of ILD is only slightly greater and diffuse than limited, so don't ignore the limiteds. And of course, being reasonable, if you have more restriction, you're less likely to live a long life. So what is the lesion we call scleroderma lung? Well, it starts out as a somewhat cellular disease. The uh, interstitium here is much thicker than it should be, but it's a lot of cells. It's inflammatory cells, myofibroblasts, and pneumocytes. It's only a little later that you start getting the fibrosis. So it turns out in recent reviews of lung biopsies from series of uh, cases with scleroderma lung, 80% have nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis. And that is probably a good reason to be treating with immunosuppressives. Well, what does this look like on high-resolution CT? Well, there are a couple of features, uh, and I'll show them to you. Uh, this is the same patient. This is just high up in the lung, and this is lower down in the lung. And the action is lower in the lung. So a lot of what I have to say pertains to what goes on primarily in the lower parts of the lung. What you see here is this kind of gray, fuzzy stuff. It's almost 40 or 50 percent of the lung field is filled with this ground glass appearance. Well, what is ground glass? Well, 10 years ago when we started scleroderma lung study, we thought it was inflammation. 10 years later, we think it is probably sub-resolution fibrosis. What that means is 